Following the fall of Vicksburg in 1863, General Ulysses S. Grant paroled 31,000 Confederate soldiers rather than go through the chore of sending them all to prison camps in the North. However, many of the Southern soldiers failed to live up to their parole promise and much to Grant's displeasure, were captured again while fighting in Chattanooga. After taking command of all the Union armies, Grant ordered an end to the prisoner exchange until Confederate officials agreed to honor a one-for-one exchange. This is last from the past, and today we are talking about prisoners of war and the camp life during the Civil War. Thanks for listening. This is last from the past. All right, welcome back to Last from the Past, Episode 7, Season 2. We're talking about the Civil War, 1861-1865, the North First or South, fighting over slavery and states' rights and don't tread on my land and all that fun shit. We've done a lot of stuff. Got me, got Jake here. Jake, one of your questions at the beginning was like, how did prisoners of war work? Yeah. How did this war, it was so friendly in ways... Not friendly in other ways. Well, it was like at the end of this, we were going to be one. That was still the end game. Yes. Either way. Like normally, you know, England fights France. Whoever wins, wins. But the French go back to France. The English go back to England. This was like, hey, we're we're going to fight and resolve this. And then we're all going to be a team again, which is yeah. pretty odd. And like they're speaking the same language. It's not like the German soldiers who you can, you can in your brain, like foreignize them you know like oh they speak a different language they're completely different people blah blah blah. like they're the enemy this is like oh dude that dude's just like me yeah and you you already made me laugh because i will get into the details but parole like seems like nice idea but totally isn't gonna work the, like, pr- the prisoner exchange system at the beginning which is what we're talking about and then i w- i wanted to just talk about kind of the the day-to-day life of the prisoners as well. We'll do both. We'll do the prisoner of war stuff right. first. Like I'm I'm just parole never had a chance. Nice nice concept, but no way. See, and that's then, what you think, but when you hear about how life was during the Civil War, then you think maybe the captured prisoners wouldn't return to battle. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. But to say like, hey, promise me you're not gonna fight against us again. You just gotta go go back to your the south and just like stay home. <laughs> right, that's just the, the reason I say that doesn't work is cuz they're like fighting for the south. Yeah. They're fighting for their <laughs> for, for their area. So like, I don't know, you think you're going to win, you want to be on that side of it, you're just going to go back and not get captured this time. Yeah. Um I loved what you said at the end when you said one for one exchange. Like, that's so logical, and normally, two sides would never come to the table and say that, I think. Like, they probably get there eventually, actually, but when you're in the middle of war and have your arms up, I think it's, you know, big middle finger both ways. This is kind of like, all right, you you get your guy back, we get our bu- guy back. Deal. There was, um, like, equations. Like, a general was worth 60 privates a private was worth one private uh, a lieutenant was worth 40 privates all that shit I, that's not the exact numbers but there was exchange sure so here's a, a factoid to open up during the civil war union forces captured between 215,000 and 220,000 prisoners not including confederate armies that surrendered at the end of the war the confederates captured between 200,000 and 211,000 federal soldiers an estimated 26,500 Confederate soldiers and 22,600 Confe- Union soldiers perished in prison camps. How many, how many died? Like about 50,000 total. It's kind of tough. More Confederate, but it's pretty, pretty close. Right. Okay. Ready? I'm just going to start reading, and we'll stop sure. when we want to stop. For the most part, soldiers taken prisoner by both sides were relatively well-treated. 
this was the Victorian era after all. And chivalry still had its place during wartime. More importantly, however, the soldiers of the North and South weren't fighting some unknown foreign enemy. They were fighting their own countrymen. To abuse another American, even a rebellious one, wasn't in the nature of most men. In addition, every soldier knew that there was a strong possibility he could be taken prisoner, so it behooved all to act with kindness toward captured enemy forces. Today it was them, tomorrow it could be you. I like that. Yeah. Little what goes around comes around. We're all gentlemen here. Yeah. At the beginning of the war, captured soldiers were expected to give parole or promise not to escape. If parole were offered and accepted, soldiers could expect to be sent back to their own lines under a flag of truce, at which time they would be sent home until an exchange was effected. It's so weird, man. It's like, yeah, I'm I'm technically a prisoner, though, so I can't go fight with you today. So if I heard that right, does that mean like you could get kidnapped, go on parole, you're back in your hometown on parole... And then if they do a trade, like if they trade a general for 60 of you, are do you technically come off parole? I think so. That's how I'm... I think that's what it said, yeah. Because, dude, right. I'm telling you, I think I get kidnapped. In the first couple years of war, and I'll get into it, like being a prisoner is kind of sweet. Yeah. Oh, they got me. I'm on parole. I guess I'm, I'm back in town and I'm the baker. <laughs> yeah. Um, Union and Confederate military officials reached an agreement in 1862 that stipulated that all prisoners were to be exchanged within 10 days of capture. They're laying out like far too friendly of groundwork. Like, yeah, every 10 days we'll trade back. It's like, what are we doing here then? You're trying to win. They really didn't think this was going to be a long war. They thought it was going to be a couple battles. They didn't really think it was going to be as bloody and vicious as it was. And in in ways it was friendly, er, than other wars, but they they really thought it was going to be a bit like a love fest of a war, and they right. the, the first couple of years like all the bands we talked about, all all some some other stuff and and then like this oh yeah we'll just give them back every ten days so after. I guess- and I I don't know if you've already answered this, but you know we've talked about kind of the love fest part of the war and how how the war is different but i mean was this the north expected to roll and the south expected to roll or was this the north expected to roll and the south were underdogs but they just were gritty and fought on like why why did this go from we're we're gonna have a couple skirmishes to a full-out war well because the North thought they were going to roll. Like the first battle of Bull Run, they thought the North was was going to be much better. Right. Virginia became part of the Confederacy late. And they were a big swing state because they had all the militia and the academy leaders from the Virginia Military Academy. Like right. The Confederacy had really good leaders. Like Lee was really good. Uh, Bedford was really good. Andrew Stonewall Jackson was really good. They had a lot of amateurs for fighters, but they had a cause on their back. So they were putting up a better fight than the North expected. North kind of had, you know, not professional soldiers, but they had, they were, they were, you know, they had the funds and shit to train them more. And the North just expected to like, you know, it was a skirmish. So if Virginia, if Virginia either somehow never joined or join the North. Do we think the Civil War is just a blip on the radar? Yeah, I think if Virginia... Uh, this is just my opinion. Okay. I, I think if Virginia... I don't... There, it's impossible to stay neutral with how much they... Right, 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 right. How right. much they swayed sides. But I think if Virginia joined the North, then yeah, this would be... All right, I'm, I'm going to just hold that over every person from Virginia's head I ever meet. But they did have slaves, so like they wouldn't have joined the North, right? But uh, they were late to join. They were they were a what's the term? Middle being state. late to the war is pretty hilarious, and then being such a power play, yeah, and still losing. 
Um, yeah, here it is. The value of a prisoner depended on his rank. During prisoner exchanges, a general was worth up to 60 privates, a major general was worth up to 40 privates, and so forth. At the bottom end, a non-commissioned officer was worth two privates, and privates were treated, traded one for one. Approximately 200,000 soldiers from both sides were freed through prisoner exchanges. It's a lot of changing. It. Yeah. A lot of trades. Yeah. All right, hold on. Let me find it. That's got to be a bad feeling when it's like, oh, all right, 55 of you guys are out. We got one coming back. Like, really? 55 of us maul that guy. Yeah, that one guy's got to be feeling pretty cool. Got to be feeling real cool. Walking, what if what if he started like day. what if there was like this is rude. So what if there's like a gimp in the sixty? You know? And the general's sure. like, not him. Oh, I'm not yeah, worth tough. I'm not worth fifty nine and a half men. Yeah, did they get to select their men? Because yeah. then that gets tough. He's like, No, I'm not worth him. I'm not worth him. I'm not yes. Maybe like he counts as a third of a man. He counts as I'll take his yeah, arms. I wonder how it cycles. Like what or what if it's just a you know short chubby guy? Like could they just be like, no, we're we're gonna take the the tall athletes? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's basically it's gym class all over again. Nice, but lives lives at stake. <laughs> lives at stake. Yeah, uh, this is how the prisoner exchange ended. Before we move on to camp life and all that, uh, and prisoner of war life. Sure. The pr- the exchange of prisoners between the north and the south lasts about ten months. That's all, Jake. This is a four-year and something war. Ten months of these, like, idyllic right. conditions. The end of the program came when black soldiers started serving in the Union Army. Hey. And why I laugh is because it, you just can you can figure out why what happened. Yeah. Uh, the Confederacy was outraged at what perceived to be the arming of escaped slaves. And in May 1863, the Confederate Congress declared that black soldiers, fugitive slaves or not, would be re-enslaved and that white officers commanding black units would be subject to execution. Yep. That's yep. Now we've now we've made it a war. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. This is why we're this is why we're fighting. Let's take away all these nice conditions. Went skirmish to war real quick. Union officials demanded that black soldiers be, soldiers be recognized as legitimate prisoners of war and included in formal prisoner exchanges. When Confederate officials refused, the Union canceled the prisoner exchange program, causing POW camps to fill quickly. The Confederacy later altered its policy by promising that only actual runaway slaves would be returned to slavery. But the Union refused to budge. Ulysses S. Grant restated the Union position in an order given in April 1864, where he said, no distinction, whatever will be made in the exchange between white and colored prisoners. I mean, that's yeah. what the war is about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's step one of this whole thing. Many people felt that Grant had an ulterior motive for ceasing prisoner exchanges, which was to damage the Confederate war machine by keeping as many Southern soldiers as possible from returning to the front. Like, why do you have to think that that's an ulterior motive? Like, that's also definitely a motive because it's a war and the less soldiers they have, the better our chances are. Right. But I mean, in theory, there's a lot of one for one trades here. So I'm guessing the North always had the numbers game. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So because otherwise that the South would say the same thing. But if the North has more numbers, end of the day, you end up you end up winning that trade. Yeah. Uh, sadly, prisoners on both sides suffered greatly as a result. Starving Northern prisoners in Andersonville. Have you heard that Andersonville? That's the most notoriously worst run camp. No, I don't know any of the like Civil War POW stuff. One of the South's worst POW camps, Andersonville. So, uh, Northern prisoners in there sent desperate petitions to Lincoln, begging him to reinstate the exchange program. The president was also lobbied by clergymen, doctors, and others who realized the dire straits of soldiers being kept in Southern prisons. However, Lincoln understood how keeping Confederate prisoners from returning to battle would damage a Southern war effort. He refused to give in. So kind of fuck, because people in Andersonville don't Google pictures of don't 
Google pictures of prisoners of war at Ander- Andersonville. Is that a don't like I should right now? No, or like don't. don't. Okay, good. It's just living skeletons. Yeah, okay. By January 1865, the Confederacy was so shorthanded on the battlefield that it seriously contemplated conscripting slaves. Eager to bolster its dwindling military ranks, the Confederate Congress finally agreed to include black soldiers in prisoner exchanges, and the program was resumed. The war ended three months later. Oh, tough, tough stretch to be at Andersonville outside of the trading hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Andersonville was fucked up. So the, uh, the only like one person from the Confederacy got charged with war crimes in the whole the whole war. Mm. And it was the guy who ran Andersonville prison, which was Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter. Okay. I know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tough. Is that I feel like that's and the whole reason we're kind of doing that. That feels like something that got skipped over in my history classes. Yeah, I watched I took and I watched a movie. I watched a movie I, in junior year of high school. I watched this. I had took this history class called uh, U.S. History through American Cinema, which okay. like, like okay, so we just watch movies. This is a movie class. I'll take that. Like for we just watched movies and we took yeah. tests on like, and then you're like okay, so what did we learn from this movie and shit? That's why, um, the movie Pearl Harbor with Ben right. Affleck, Josh Hartnett. I watched that with Katie the other day. I'd never seen the love scene scenes because my teacher showed us nice. a version with like so a version with all of those completely cut out. Right. And it's a really cool movie about all that stuff. I watch it with Katie. The love scenes are terrible. Sorry. It was a good movie until I saw those. Cuba Gooding in that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he plays a, a like a chef on the ship that boxes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, the conditions at POW camps varied greatly. At the beginning of the war, when prisoner exchanges helped keep prisoners relatively empty, conditions were fairly good on both sides. Prisoners were usually well-treated, well-fed, and adequately closed. This remained true for most prisons in the North throughout the war, but the conditions of POW camps in the South deteriorated greatly as the Confederacy gradually found itself unable to feed and clothe even its own citizens and soldiers, yet alone prisoners. That's the main issue. The right. Georgia prison was known as Andersonville. Is probably best known for the squalic, squalid and barbaric conditions in which northern prisoners were housed. But it wasn't alone. Most prison officials did their best to maintain human conditions, but they had less and less to work with during the final years of war. The beginning of the prisoner camps I was reading in another book I have was like they'd play baseball. They'd yeah. play sports. They were like just hanging out for 10 days before the exchange happened. It was like a nice recess from war. Friendly POW camp, kind of the way to go. Because that's that's what I'm running through in my head right now. Because you and I are the guys that I think we're doing anything to get out of actual battle. Um, I mean, if I could run like the cool POW camp and I'm like the camp counselor, I'm slipping guys extra pieces of bread and stuff, I, I think that's my niche. <laughs> the cool guy <laughs> at prisoner of war camp i'm the cool camp counselor <laughs> well, hey we know that you're a bunch of yankees but down here at uh camp uh jake we treat you right <laughs> i'll be calling balls and strikes today okay buddy Look like a second baseman little guy <laughs> you turn it you can turn it every every pow that comes in i ask him <laughs> Ask them their baseball position. Okay. Oh, pitcher. Uh, interested to see that. Yeah. The yeah. The last exchange, they took all my pitchers away from me. We needed pitchers. What if when when did baseball did baseball really exist like teams during the Civil War? Is that a weird question? There had to be teams, but I don't know what you mean. You mean professional like, teams? Not like MLB. Yeah. Yeah, I, they had to be town teams. Like, do you think anyone's profession in this time was a baseball scout? <laughs> <laughs> scout? Because um, yeah. I'm guessing no. Yeah? I don't know. Profession's weird, but so, um, yeah, they had, like, professional teams, it looks like. So how did you get on those? You just tried out? I guess so. Yeah, tryouts must have been 
the thing before scouting. But yeah, baseball scout dream job. Just getting all these handsome strong boys brought into POW camp. It's a different way to look at the war, I guess. We found your we found your pastime. Hey Jake, yeah. if you could go back in time. Yeah. And do one thing. What would you do? Oh. I'd Easy. go run baseball at Civil War camps. <laughs> yeah. I'd be the friendly camp counselor at the POW camp. Let's see that arm. You, you miss you miss the extra piece of bread too. Yeah, you're giving them extra piece of bread too. I'm giving an extra piece of bread. So to everyone or just people that played well? The ones that deserved it, yeah. Okay. Okay. Hustle gets rewarded. No prisoner of war camp was more reviled than the Confederate prison constructed near the village of Andersonville in Sumter County, Georgia. Its name became synonymous with barbar- bar- barbarism and ill treatment. Andersonville was opened in February 1864 after the high number of northern prisoners started taking a heavy toll on the food supplies in Richmond, where prisoners had previously been housed. When the first prisoners arrived at the new camp, they were greeted by 16 acres of open land surrounded by a 15-foot-tall stockade. Originally designed to house 10,000 men, the facility soon contained more than three times that number and was expanded to 26 acres. Nearly 400 prisoners arrived every day. Yikes. That's crazy. Yeah. How were there enough wars, like battles every day? Like I read today that... Soldiers did nothing 75% of the time in the war. Right. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of numbers, man. I think that it was like everyone. Everyone came and went through a camp. Yeah. I mean, the story we told last week about that fist fight. Oh, man, dude, that fist fight story makes so much sense now. That had to be at the beginning of the war. No, it was actually at the Battle of Wilderness, which was later on in the war. No, it was somewhat early enough. And those guys just, they were like, yeah, loser surrenders. We'll go to one of those sweet camps, play some baseball, hang out with Jake, and then we're gone. Right. That story makes so much more sense now that the beginning of war was good conditions. So I don't want to go into how terrible Andersonville was. Right. But it was really, really bad. They uh, When they walked in, people just thought they were walking into hell on earth. Yeah. And it was, it was just walking skeletons. Like, they're the skinniest. It's like if you've had the unfortunate thing of looking at, like, Holocaust victims. It's right. Andersonville. It's just, you you know what I'm talking about. I think we've all, I think, well, I don't know how education or any of that stuff's changed, but I, I think we've all seen pictures of that, and that's exactly what I was picturing. Yeah, yeah it's disgusting. The North, the North had some bad facilities as well. Point Lookout in Maryland was bad. And Elmira, Elmira, New York had a really bad one. They called it Hellmira. Could have just been for the cool nickname there. Yeah. But uh, I am, I'm not going to go into that much of that, how shitty it was. Yeah. There was uh, an escape. Probably a lot of escapes. The great escape, the biggest escape, took place. In a former cotton warehouse in Richmond. Richmond. Just everything's going on in Richmond. It's yeah, part of the war. Which what? The Libby and Son Chandlers and Grocery. The Libby and Son Chandlers and Grocery. Is that the worst name of a grocery store you've ever heard? Libby and Sons? The Libby and Son Chandlers and Grocery. Yeah, it's tough. Sounds like three different things. Sounds like an illiterate opened a store. <laughs> Could have. <laughs> Maybe like, that was endearing. Yeah. That was Libby and her son Chandler's. I don't even get it. <laughs> it was a small three structure that held 1,200 men in eight crowded, filthy rooms. The uh, Union Colonel Thomas E. Rose orchestrated the escape. The prisoners dug a long, crude tunnel from the prison cellar and the rest of the prisoners held a musical show to occupy the prison staff while Rose and his men disappeared through the tunnel into the city of Richmond. 109 prisoners were missing. A total of 59 managed to make it back to Union lines, two drowned while crossing streams, and the rest, including Rose, were captured by Confederate forces. Good time, though. 
And you got a crew that big trying to escape. An escape is always a good time. Yeah. Yo, speaking of good times, I'm just going to pivot right to this right away. Because I was okay. reading about life during the war and on camp and on the battlefields and, you know, just how they lived. Sure. And listen, listen to this story. So alcohol wasn't allowed, right? But people were going to get sure. their drink on, damn right. The members of one clever Mississippi company managed to sneak a half gallon of whiskey past guards by pouring it into a watermelon. Wow. Then they kept the watermelon hidden by burying it beneath the floor of their tent and drinking it through long straws. That's a good time. That's a lot to take in right now. Uh, do we think that was the first ever boozy watermelon? Uh, no. But maybe. Maybe though, right? Walking Are these into guys geniuses. Walking into that tent, like, oh, George, Harry, what are you guys up to today? And they're just like laughing their asses off, like, oh, you gotta see what we fucking got, man. What are those straws? You just drinking the dirt? Are you drinking the dirt again? <laughs> no, nah, there's a watermelon <laughs> under there, dude. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what are you what are you you drinking a watermelon? Oh, there's whiskey in the watermelon, dude. Oh old... get you got an extra straw? No. No way was there an extra straw. <laughs> like I didn't even know st- Like what was the straw made of? This is where my head's at. You're when did plastic straws get invented? Like no way during the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> okay, when did plastic straws become popular? Drinking straw. It's got its own Wikipedia page. Of course it does. Wow, there's a website that said a brief history of plastic straws. The first known straws were made by the Sumerians and were used for drinking beer, probably to okay. avoid the solid byproducts. The ryegrass straw in the 1800s was in fashion because it was cheap and soft. But it had an unfortunate tendency to turn into mush. <laughs> sure. Grass. The wax paper straw was 1888. So, yeah, they're drinking out of, looks like they're drinking out of rye grass straws. Grass straw. Okay. That's rye a- whiskey, rye grass. I'm into it. Rye grass straws. So It's like yeah. a Twizzler straw. Yeah, that's cool. It's basically just a piece of hay <laughs> they're, they're drinking out of. That's funny. Good, good, good question there, Jake. Thank you. But that's a fun time. That's a good time. Yeah. And you're drinking, you're drinking booze out of a straw out of a watermelon underground. The that's the equivalent of us sneaking beer balls into the dorm room on Fridays and just sitting in the dorm all drinking out of one beer ball, beer ball of Friday. But these guys were in the 1800s in the Civil War using a watermelon to drink whiskey. And was this one time or was this regular? A regular? I'm I'm going to guess it happened once. It's a lot of work. That's something you do it once and you're like, that was so much fun. I'm going to enjoy looking back on this for the rest of my life. But it wasn't fun enough to do it again. We can't replicate this. Yeah. 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 A lot, a lot of non really history questions there. Like, did they eat the watermelon afterwards? Did they know that the booze would absorb into the watermelon? Was boozy watermelon a thing going back years now? They ate I the thought, watermelon. I thought that afterwards. was made up by like drunk fratters recently. No, that had to be. I would guess like old kings and queens did that shit in the medieval ages. Okay, that's cool. I just never thought of it like that. Yeah. Um. Bathing was a rare luxury for soldiers in the field, so the stench within the tents was suffocating during inclement weather when the flaps had to be lowered. Yeah. The whole the whole place just smelled all the time. I was going to say, like, I'd, I don't care about myself smelling, and then I'd put it together that it was thousands of thousands of people being very smelly. Oh, dude, smellier than you've ever been. The smelliest. They're in war. In I wool- don't think it'd be smellier than I've ever been. They're in war. In right. wool clo- cloth, right. in the heat of a southern summer, right? Marching and drills every day, like 
right. six mile hikes every day, and they all have diarrhea. Right. They're the smelliest. You've you've never been as smelly as the Civil War. I've eaten a lot of eggs. Yeah. Well, yeah. You you there without passing gas. They're the smelliest you could ever be. What about the igloo time? Imagine someone starts. <laughs> yeah, the igloo time's fucked. <laughs> that was one one fart. <laughs> Toxic. We spent all day <laughs> building an igloo out of snow, and by the time it was done, Jake ripped ass inside of it <laughs> and hot boxed the whole thing, and we couldn't enjoy it because the the smell never left it. It's disgusting. It was so foul. It was vile. I got threw up a little bit. That sucked. Uh, um, I thought this was interesting. The wedge tent, they had all these tents and they were like going on tents. One tent was named after the guy. Eventually, like the South just ran out of so much money. But when ca- so when campus became scarce, many soldiers were forced to op- to make open air beds by piling leaves or straw between logs and covering it up with a blanket or poncho. During the winter, crude huts were made out of wood when wood was available. Shitty man. Like Yeah. And they said the thing, the thing that really, like, the thing that people, soldiers suffered from the most in the Civil War, is three things. Diarrhea. Yep. Homesickness. These were a bunch of little pussies that had never left their hometown. Never been anywhere. Never been anywhere. So a lot of them didn't really care for the cause. A lot of them just wanted to travel, and, like, this was their way to see places. Right. And... Boredom. Tough. So boredom, homesickness. But like the things they did were kind of fun. They they had uh, they wrote long letters home or read books and magazines and newspapers. They played cards and engaged in various sports such as boxing, baseball, and cockfighting. Some camps camps desperate for activity even staged cockroach and lice races. Yikes! That's gross. Lice races? Grow up, dude. Boxing. Boxing what? sounds pretty miserable. Well, we're, we're we're already at war, so like I'm already exhausted. Yeah, but you know what? Two guys are always going to want to fight, and then the rest of we just get to watch. Yeah, that's true. Drinking and gambling were discouraged, but both activities were nearly impossible to control, especially after payday. Many soldiers lost their wages almost as quickly as they got them. Yeah, because what are you going to use them for? You're yeah. fucking in war. Contact with prostitutes, known colloquially as horizontal refreshments. Do you like that term? I don't hate that term. Yeah, I'm going to go get some horizontal refreshments. That's so 1800s. Say it in your best 1800s voice. Uh, How about we head out of here and get ourselves some horizontal refreshments? You and I both just do Conan when he does old time baseball. Skills. Yes. <laughs> what a cooling breeze. <laughs> uh, what else did I find? Ooh, yo. So they had to be, they had to punish people when they were doing stuff wrong. Listen to this weird ass punishment. Sure. It's going to be, it's kind of hard to describe. I had to read this twice when I read it. Uh, One popular military punishment of the era involved placing a knife or piece of wood between the man's teeth, keeping it in place with a string tied around his ears. So the piece of wood, like if you were to bite down on a piece of wood, like during a surgery. Okay. And then, and then a string keeping it in place. So you couldn't unbite. Right. Behind your ears. Yeah. That's a bad time. Then they'd hog tie your knees to your chest and your arms around your knees and tie you there and just leave you like that for hours. Yeah, I always never been a fan of the hog tie. So it's like, oh, what did I do to, to get in this? I won't do it again. I won't do it again. Promise. This sucks. I saw one of our one of our friends hog tie someone once. Who? Just this just the start of it. <laughs> is our is our buddy Chisholm. Um, at University of Maryland, one one of his buddies was like 
they were like fake fighting each other, and the other guy was talking shit a little bit. <laughs> so Chisholm gave him the full look over here, look over here, and then I forget what he had, but he just straight hogtied him with the other hand. It was it was incredible. Well, just just the feet. Oh, okay. He he didn't go all the way through with it, but it was incredible how quickly it went from a person not being hogtied to be having his feet hogtied. Yeah, that sucks. Pretty defenseless once you're there. Oh yeah, you've <laughs> you've lost everything. Uh, here's here's another grossness of war. So like I said, they're all so excited to go, right? In the north, they all met up in Washington D.C. beforehand, before okay. the before the war even started. Um, and they were so excited because they were like in the big city for the first time. They just okay. never seen anything like that. Washington, oh, yeah. Washington was like crowded with people it's incredibly crowded with people Drun- drunken nights everything so listen to this passage hotels and boarding houses were filled to overflowing soldiers jammed the saloons slugged down juleps and gin slings and whiskey skins and brandy mashes and brawled in the streets often brandishing revolvers and bayonets sanitary conditions were nightmarish the washington canal running through the middle of the city, became an open toilet, a receptacle for all the city's sewage, human human and otherwise. It all found its way to the Potomac and, according to a government report, spread out in thinner proportions over several hundred acres of flats immediately in front of the city, the surface of which is exposed to the action of the sun at intervals during the day and the miasma what's that word and the miasma from which contaminates every breath of air which passes the stench was everywhere and inescapable thus the men waited for their unimaginable war they would not wait much longer it's just bad times this is why people talk about going back in time and i want to live in this era like no you don't not this era that's also andersonville had a stream running through the prison hmm. and they would try to piss and shit downstream so they could drink upstream right. like eventually it was just all terrible Ugh. bad times hard times that's about it that's about it you got any other questions i can try and look up real quick got any thoughts I don't know. I guess it's it's kind of if you asked what I expected, I I would have liked to think I could have landed on the the trade thing. Um I guess what I was looking for was the fact that it did escalate. Like it was <laughs> it was kind of friendly. Oh, you're a POW, you'll probably be back in 10 days. Actually, we just sh- sent back a shipment 4 days ago, so you'll probably be out in 6 days to <laughs> like you're a prisoner of war and there's a good chance you're going to die. Yeah. It's uh it's it's the whole war basically went like that. Like it's gonna be a couple battles, be nothing, we'll exchange prisoners, we'll have a lot of bands, and then eventually I mean the South running out of money is just a main a main theme of the whole war. They just didn't yeah. have the ability to do this, but how friendly they wanted to start out the prisoner exchange is crazy. Right. But the thing that hit me the hardest was that Lincoln knew about the conditions and the and the soldiers, the prisoners of war in Andersonville and all that. And he had to, you know, that's a tough decision as leader to have to try and think through and, and make. Right. Do, do I help these people now or do I risk a chunk more of the war in general. Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know the numbers, but what if freeing those people extended the war another year and then instead of 5,000 prisoners dying, you know, it turns into another 25,000 people dying. Yeah. I don't know. Bad times. Hard times. Um, the other thing... Baseball sounds fun. Oh yeah, just pl- and dude, prob- probably a lot of junk talking. You know, playing the a guards. Lot of junk so talking. they should make a movie about a prisoner, uh, an early 
prisoner of war camp in the Civil War, like the longest yard. Right. Where was the, you know, Union prisoners versus the Confederate guards in baseball. 1980s baseball. Or 1850s. (laughs) I mean, we'd, we'd watch, but we might be the only ones who watch. The... If if you're trying to win, uh, like a, an award type movie, I think you do. Slave that escapes from the South goes up north, joins the North in the fight, fights, gets captured, and then it's by like someone he was friendly with or something. I don't know. Stuff. Stuff. Andersonville. There's a movie about Andersonville. From uh, 1996. I watched that in my American movie class. It's pretty good. Okay. Won't watch it, but <laughs> thanks. You should go watch it. No, it sounds bad. I don't like the ending or the middle or the, probably the start. <laughs> okay. I think they all escape. I think it's okay, an escape well. movie. All right. Now all I'm right. interested. Yeah, but what if I tell you that Dennis Forrest is in it? Done. He plays Mad Matthew. Love DF. Big... <laughs> You'd be your big DF fan. If you saw his main picture in IMDb, DB, you would like him. Oh, he played Sweet Eddie in The Mask, so you are a big... Big DF fan. Big DF fan. There you go. All right, that's the end of episode six of Laughs from the Past. Civil War. Prisoners of War. Don't get caught. Get caught in the early bits. It must have been funny when... The last prisoner exchange happened, and like it was like dwindling. It was like, oh, dude, you don't want to go back. Yeah, like I know that for a while it's been a fun time and a little vacation. Like it's it's different now, dude. Yeah, there had Tough to be transition. one dude who his buddy was like, dude, no, it's actually not that bad. You play baseball, you get some food, you get to relax a little bit. No drilling, no sleeping in, like no marching every day. You just kind of chill. Right. He's like, All right. I'll get in a, a couple. I'll get in a fist fight. I'll surrender. Then you're 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 fifty pounds at Andersonville, wondering why you ever took the advice of old Jimmy. Yeah, no no sideway refreshments here. <laughs> Horizontal refreshments. Horizontal refreshments, <laughs> aka sex. Whores. Whores. All right, thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next week. Another episode. We got four more. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Four more. We're going to close out this Civil War with some more fun stories and then do a big question and answer at the end. So send those in. uh, And maybe uh, another section. Like, I don't know if we're going to do another chapter, if we're going to go back to random stories, what it's going to be. But if you have a uh, a section of history that has a bunch of stories within it, like the Civil War, let us know. All examples and and everything is welcome. See ya. And much to and much to Grant's chagrin, and much to Grant's chagrin, 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 nope. chagrin, and much to Grant's chagrin, <laughs> chagrin, like sha, chagrin, Charlotte, chagrin, Char- Charlotte, chagrin, chagrin, and much to Grant's chagrin, <laughs> <laughs> and much and much to Grant's displeasure, were captured again. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 